Welcome to the Cashflow Chronicles. I'm your host, Johnny Catani, and the founder of Catani Capital Group. For the last two years, I've been studying alternative assets and now help solve the problem of creating passive cash flow for creators, influencers, and busy professionals by bringing you five episodes a week of easy to understand education in the world of passive investing. What's up, guys? Happy Friday. Welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Chronicles. Friday follow-up on the Cashflow Chronicles. I'm your host, Johnny Catani, and happy March, everybody. Holy cow. Uh, 2023 already flying along. Uh, it's crazy to think that um, we're almost through uh, Q1, so that's, uh, that's fascinating. And uh, a lot happening. Uh, let's see, next week is the best ever conference starting on Tuesday, Tuesday through Friday. Uh, fascinating, fascinating observation about, uh, real estate. Uh, and this is true, uh, for all facets of real estate, or at least all, all of the ones that I've explored is things happen like during the week, right? So for instance, this is Tuesday through Friday, which means that you will have the whole weekend pretty much. Right. Uh, when I was a realtor, we, all meetings, meetups were like typically during lunchtime uh, in the middle of the week, which was great because you always got free food. I mean, if you want, if you want to get me to go anywhere, uh, free food, that's the way to do that. So that was true. Let's see. The Utah Rias are almost always on a Tuesday or Thursday, unless it's like a full day. For instance, when they did, uh, their whole, they did a whole day on short-term rentals and it was on a Saturday because it was literally all day. Now I did not attend the whole day, but, uh, you know, that was kind of the exception. So next week I'm pretty much booked up. I've got a couple podcast recordings on Tuesday and then that's it. I'm, I'm going to be going hard at best ever, uh, which I'm really excited for. I've got a deal in my back pocket that I'm hoping to find someone interested in terms of the operation group. Um, I can bring capital, uh, investor capital. Obviously I've got the deal. Uh, I've done some underwriting, even locked in a potential property manager as well. So it's all but buttoned up. Really what I'm just waiting for is a, an experienced group or experienced investor to come in and kind of take over the rest of it. I would say I've got 30% of it. So that offers 70% to someone. So that's pretty sweet, uh, pretty sweet deal there for sure. I'm really excited about it. It's right downtown. I believe I've talked about it. It's a mixed use, brand new, A-class, luxury, eight luxury apartments and a bar, a bar restaurant downstairs uh, that's currently on a 12 year triple net with the top uh, bar ownership group in Salt Lake City. So really, really awesome deal. I'm very excited about it. I was on a call today with the property management company and tried to just poke as many holes in it as possible and not really finding anywhere it'll break so um, there's some numbers we need to kind of clear up. Um, don't have the most in-depth uh, expenses and, and data on it. So there's a few things we need to button up that could, I don't want to say they're make or break though. Uh, they're more on the the make, like they'll, they'll just make it even better. They it, it it could make it worse, but I don't see it making it so bad that it doesn't still pencil. Now, there's a monster, monster asterisk next to this because I'm still new in my underwriting, still an infant in my infancy, as one might say, in terms of my underwriting skills. So there's probably some things that I've missed or I'm overlooking. Um, but like I've played with all the debt. I've you know, I mean, I've got it underwritten at a 65% uh, LTV loan to value. Talked about that last week. That means, you know, 
that means we're bringing 35 percent of the purchase price in equity meaning you know between you know gp funds and and investor funds so pretty you know very very conservative underwriting i mean i've even underwritten a one percent rental increase uh i even put negative so based on the market rents they have now i don't look five of the eight units are already rented so it's easy to be so you can clearly you know prove that hey this is market rent but for the others we may have to come down on the rent and i came way down i even underwrote with a pro forma being worse aka essentially the stabilized rents being worse than what we're getting now and it's still pencils so really excited about that honestly but again you know big big asterisk there waiting to find someone who can just like poke the the hole in it to be like this deal doesn't doesn't work if not then we might be onto something um so very very excited about that also really really awesome exciting news i had the one and only the man that i've talked about ad nauseum here founder of raise masters uh friend mentor uh hunter thompson was on my podcast and made an announcement that he has not announced anywhere else yet. So we got an exclusive announcement from Hunter. That episode airs March 14th. So very, very excited about that. Uh, things are rolling right along. I mean, gosh, we are in month 11. You guys, this podcast launched 11 months ago. Well, almost. March 11th will be 11 months if we're getting very technical. So you know, basically what's that like next week? I don't know. Let's pull up a calendar here. That might be a weekend. I'm terrible with dates unless it's like an important date. Yeah, it is. It's next Saturday. So we won't have an episode for next Saturday, but you know, we will have uh, the Friday follow-up will be literally the day before. So that will be a very special episode. It's only 11 months. So it won't quite be the year episode, um, also teaser for what I'm working on to have for the April, let's see, April 11th is a Tuesday suite. Okay. So what I'm hoping to work on for April 11th is a, I'm not going to say who, because I don't want to jinx it, but he's basically the godfather of daily real estate podcasts. Hint, hint. So if you are in the industry, you should know who that is. But looking forward to potentially getting him as a guest to um, to bring in my one-year mark. And he will be our best ever. So I'm literally going to pitch it right to his face. So I have a feeling it'll be hard for him to say no because it's a pretty compelling pitch um, to say, hey, you know, I've got a a daily real estate podcast and I've been going, you know, we're 11 months in since we aired too. This is, I mean, this marks, we're easily into a year of recording. Um, yeah, I think I started recording by now. No, yes, I did. Yeah, I did start recording by now or close to now. So what's funny is I marked the April 11th launch date and then I hadn't even recorded an episode when I decided on that date. And the reason that I did it was to force me to start recording because um, Whitney Sewell, shout out to Whitney Sewell, also has a daily real estate podcast, uh, but not the guest I'm thinking of, although he would, he needs, I need to get him on the podcast because he's incredible and I will talk to him a best ever as well. But Talk to Whitney Sewell at best ever last year. Uh, gosh, man, this is just nostalgia. This, this conference means the world to me and having it in my backyard is just absolutely incredible. I'm very, very excited, but talk to Whitney Sewell and he's like, you should probably have somewhere near 50 or 60 episodes recorded. So I started recording like say like 10, eight to 10 to 12 episodes a week, starting like the middle of March in order to be able to launch so there was like a four week period where I think I recorded 
like 12 episodes a week for like four weeks, four and a half weeks. Cause I think I had 50 or 52 episodes right before we aired. I mean, just silly. Like it, it's, I mean, I was recording, like I would have back to back to back, like four or five episodes where I didn't even get up. Like I would get up, go to the bathroom, get some water and record again. Didn't eat. It was, it was gnarly. It was gnarly looking back. Gosh, it's one of those things where comedians actually talk about this a lot because of how much of a grind it is to get started and get going in comedy where a lot of them talk about how they don't know if they'd be able to do it again. Now, being where I'm at now, it would be very challenging to start a daily podcast, right? Where, you know, like my time is actually used up, right? I've got social media, I've got broker relationships, uh, you know, investor calls and all the things that take up my time now. I think it would be very challenging to throw in a daily, to start a daily. But now that I've got it as a well-oiled machine where I pretty much just hit record and pretty much just hit record and I've got a team that takes care of the rest, it's it's a, it's a far less daunting task to maintain, right? But whereas starting up would be such a challenge right now which is why most people don't, right? Because most people don't just enter <laughs> enter the industry greener than green like I did and just launch into a podcast, let alone a daily podcast, you know? So uh, it would be interesting, you know, to think of, it's interesting to think about now whether or not I would, I would start up a daily, a daily podcast. Uh, so fascinating for sure. But anyways, uh, let's continue into what I want to talk about. So last week we talked about underwriting, kind of the basics to underwriting. I don't know that I necessarily want to do an underwriting series. Uh, I've plugged the book and I've plugged it on social media too. The book I'm pulling from, Definitive Guide to Underwriting Multifamily Acquisitions. Guys, go right now, literally right now, unless you're driving, uh, Please do not get on your phone while you're driving. But as soon as you can, go to Instagram and TikTok and follow me on social media at Johnny Katani if you don't already. J O N N Y C A T T A N I. A lot of really great content coming your way. Starting to really roll out the new content for for new investors, which is obviously my avatar, right? Like I'm a new investor. You guys are gonna be following along my entire journey. So really excited for that. Um, what I'm going to talk about this week in terms of multifamily or multifamily, it is multifamily uh, underwriting, is I'm just going to give some definitions and some derivatives. So uh, basically what I want to talk about, so underwriting is a science and an art, which I've talked about. And it's really, really important because it's important to understand where numbers are derived from in terms of like, uh, you know, the IRR and the equity multiple and the cash flow and the cash on cash and kind of all of the things that uh, go into it. And so what I want to talk about is I want to talk about the assumptions specifically because the assumptions are where you can get crazy. And, and it's not the only place you can get crazy, but it's one of the places where you can get crazy in terms of like, if you're not conservative in your assumptions, your underwriting is going to be, un, is going to be, you know, extremely speculative and it's going to show numbers that really are most likely not realistic. In fact, they're not going to be realistic. Right. And, and it, it, it can be very market dependent. I don't want to blanket statement that because, you know, if you're, if let's say the last three years, your market, the rental increases have been eight to 12% in your market. And then you throw in a 5%, you know, and you underwrite at a 5%, you can make the case that that is conservative underwriting, Right especially when you've got, you know, three years, basically 36 months of 
let's say an average of 10% and you underwrite at 5%. Now I give that example to talk about my assumption and how I underwrite and I underwrite, I underwrite at a 2% annual rental increase, right? So extremely conservative because if a deal pencils and we roll it out at 2% and then rent goes up 8%, that's just icing on the cake, right? Like if, if we can make it work at 2% and we get 8%, then, you know, everybody's going to be very, very happy. But, you know, for instance, Salt Lake City rents are plateauing. I just had a conversation with a very good uh, broker friend of mine who's very, very dialed, especially in the downtown market. And, you know, he's like, if you're underwriting at 5%, he's like, that's almost too aggressive. So I underwrite at 2%. In fact, I even dropped my underwriting model down to 1% for this downtown deal, and it's still penciled. So, you know, it, it's plateauing. And I think it's going to plateau for the next, like, I th- I think 2023, you'll maybe see a 1% to 2% increase, maybe, if anything. The reason that Salt Lake is a bit of an anomaly, despite the, uh, I'm drinking I'm drinking kombucha, by the way, for those who are watching. Um, it's very good. Get it at Costco. Hum. Uh, I love kombucha. And I don't drink alcohol anymore. Oh, my gosh. That reminds me, you guys. I totally forgot. I've got to give my review of my 60 days no alcohol. Here's my review. Um, so I'm going to take a drink of my kombucha. It's all gone. And I didn't even realize. So that's a tough look. Um Okay, so I don't want to get distracted. This is my ADD brain here. But my ADHD dizzle, my ADHDs. I've got ADHDs. Not sure what HDs are, but I got 80 of them. Uh so so I'm going to go off on a tangent here about sobriety because it's really really important because it's led to uh, a a monster decision. So I may have talked about Uh, I did. I've talked about on the podcast how Sam and I uh, decided to go 60 days sober because we saw dry January and we said, we'll raise you another 30 days because that's just the type of people that we are. And so 30 days was pretty easy. And then the Super Bowl rolled around and my Eagles made it in the Super Bowl and we drank, decided to drink and the Eagles lost. And I only just drank more because of that. But it was horrible. Uh, I didn't like it. So what was happening when I, when the alcohol finally left my system, you know, because it takes like close to three weeks, you know, to completely purge your system of alcohol. That's how freaking poisonous it is. And I was sleeping incredibly. I mean, just like would get in bed at like nine 30, be asleep, you know, didn't even put on a movie, would just go to bed. Sometimes I would read, go right to sleep. Sometimes I'll take edibles or uh, smoke. Uh, It is legal medically here in Utah. So, and even before it wasn't, I smoked. So, you know, shout out to, um, shout out to my, to my stoners out there. Uh, I'm no longer a stoner by definition. I do not smoke all the time, but I do enjoy it at night and edibles, uh, especially, uh, just because I feel like it's more of a body high and puts you to sleep. So that being said, my sleep is getting so good that I didn't even need to. Like sometimes I just wouldn't even smoke. I could just go to sleep, right? Because I would work so hard all day because my productivity was through the roof, you guys. Like I was so productive. I would, first of all, you sleep, I sleep great, right? So I wake up. It's very easy for me to get up 6 a.m. at the gym by 6.30, home by 8 sitting on my desk by nine and my, and the way that I set my calendar up is I block off my time. So like, you know, this hour goes to this, this hour goes to this, you know, if it's a Tuesday or Thursday, maybe there's some, uh, some podcasts in there and then some investor calls, whatever it may be. Right. And very productive, you know, take my dog for walks and then boom, uh, back to sleep. Right. And we started all over again. And what's funny about for me as an observation, productivity is 
um, like compounding for me. So because I'm so productive, it like makes me happy and makes me want to be more productive. So then I want to do more. So like I'm getting stuff done, which makes me, you know, motivated to get more stuff done. And it's just compounding and just stuff got done. And when I tell you that got interrupted by drinking for the Super Bowl, I mean, it got interrupted. Sleep went away, you know, I was back to, you know, pre-sleep anxiety, you know, morning anxiety was through the roof. It was bad. So we have made the executive decision, or I say we, Sam and I both made decision, but I made the decision that I'm just, I'm alcohol sober uh, for the foreseeable future. And I don't want to make it part of my personality, but what I've realized is that it almost has to become it because there are so many things that involve alcohol that when you're not drinking, it's immediately the first question people ask you. And most people, at least in the professional circle, are very receptive. They're like, that's awesome. Personally, you know, I was a partier. I still like to have a good time. And what I've noticed is that when everyone's having a good time, I actually don't need to drink. I can just feed off that energy and have a great time. It's when I need to manufacture the the vibe and the energy that I would drink, you know, because it loosens everything up. And it's just extremely unnecessary. And, you know, as the kids say, I'm in my millionaire era, you know, I'm working towards a goal and I've now A and B tested and the A test is sobriety and I'm so much more productive and I like myself more. And therefore I have no desire to drink right now. And I know Sam doesn't either. And it's just been really, really great. And so, you know, if you've been thinking about it, I encourage you to just take 30 days, you know, try it out. You know, what I've noticed personally is I feel like a lot of people really want to stop drinking. They just don't. Like when I told people that I was going 60 days, some of my friends were like, you know, only good things are going to come from it. You know, like almost encouraging me not to do it because they were afraid this exact thing would happen. And here we are. I don't drink and it's amazing. And I almost just, it's almost like a point of like, like now it's like point of pride. Now it's like, yeah, I don't drink, you know? So I understand why people on social media make it part of their personalities. And I hate that I became that because I wanted to make a point, not to make it part of my personality, but it is right. Because so much uh, is, Alcohol surrounds so many events that it, it just comes up a lot. So there it is. There's my review. It's led to what could potentially be a lifetime of sobriety. Now, again, I put a, a caveat there that right now what's required of me is so much energy towards my work that losing even 1% of productivity is, is compounding. And so, you know, that's not to say that I won't eventually drink again uh, when things slow down or when I can slow down a little bit, but I just don't anticipate things slowing down because it's just like, you know, you get to a million, you know, like you get your first deal and then it's just a rocket ship from there. You just want to do more and more and more. And the goal is to eventually be doing one acquisition in Salt Lake City per quarter. And, you know, I'll break down what goes through it as I get a deal going and I'll give you kind of a play by play, but you guys, what happens between an LOI, so letter of intent, and a closing is daunting. There's a lot. Now, when you're in the A class world and you're buying brand new stuff, it's not as bad because, you know, you're not like having to worry about what's going to be behind a wall and what the plumbing is like and, you know, how long, how much longer the roof's going to last and doesn't need a new parking lot and, and kind of all the things that go into capital expenditures, but you know, it, it'll just make, I, I just enjoy it more. And I enjoy the, the version of myself for, that I get when I'm not drinking. So there you have it. There's my review 60 days sober. Well, we went 42 days sober, 42 days sober led to, uh, uh, an indefinite alcohol sobriety. Want to emphasis the alcohol there because, as I mentioned before, uh, I have a friend who coined it California sober, 
So don't drink alcohol, but um, still enjoy cannabis. So very excited for that. So um, that this has been a, a long episode already. So um, I may go into more of the assumptions next week, although next week will be more about the the kind of a review. Well, it'll be a midweek review. I record these midweek. So um, and maybe I'll save the review for the... 17th which will be st patrick's day It'll be st patty's day on the 17th so what i'll do is i'll just run through my assumptions really quick so you can see what they're like um so i'm just going to go through my stabilized assumptions so uh you have an asset management fee that's an annual fee that's two percent basically that just keeps the lights on every year right um because cash flow, cash flow covers obviously your debt, and then you got to pay investors, and so the the annual asset management fee basically just covers like extra expenses that always come up, right? I mean, there's always going to be things that come up that you don't foresee, and that really just breaks even there. Uh, again, that's two percent of the. Um, So you have your acquisition fee. That's 2% of the acquisition. Um, but then you have your, uh, uh, uh sorry, effect, excuse me, of effective gross income. So basically 2% of like your stabilized income, essentially what that fee would come from. And again, you know, on a million dollars, that's uh, $20,000. So you know, take that for, <laughs> take that for what it's worth, right? Uh, $20,000, you know, you split that amongst the GP and, you know, you're, you're getting like a, a cool high five, you know, cool, crisp high five is as uh Deadpool would say. So there's that, uh, you got your property management fee. This is going to vary. It's anywhere from five to 7% of the gross. Um, that's going to be gross potential rent. Uh, typically they're not going to take additional fees, you know, typically additional fees are going to go straight to the owner. Um, but that, that varies. Uh, next we've got our, so you got your property tax. That's again, going to vary. That's going to literally vary on by market, uh, property tax rate, um, in Salt Lake city. It's like 0.3%, 0.03% or sorry, 0.3%. It just, it really depends. That's just what I have in there to make it easier. I actually need to get with a tax, county tax assessor to get that super dialed, but that's a very conservative uh, number. Uh, annual rental increase. So this is, again, what I talked about earlier. This is where you can get carried away. Currently, I have it set to 1% in my model just because, like I said, I'm being extremely conservative. But on a on a typical basis, like if I were to get a new deal right now in my inbox that I wanted to underwrite, I would have it at a 2% rental increase, which is extremely conservative. And that's what you want to see from people when you're vetting deals and you're looking at their assumptions, you want to see like 2 3%. Even in markets like Dallas, where they're getting 8 to 12% regularly, you want to see that. Uh, annual expense increase, 2%. Uh, property tax increase, 3%. Vacancy rate, the average vacancy right now in Salt Lake City is 3%. I have it set to 5%. Um, not uncommon to technically stabilize as 90% occupancy. So you could do this up to 10%, you know, if you wanted to get really crazy. For this deal, I have it, no joke, I have it set at 20% because this is a weird one because it's eight units. So if, you know, one unit is down um if one unit is down that's 12 and a half percent occupancy so or sorry 12 and a half percent vacancy so i basically doubled that because again you guys i'm trying to poke holes in this thing and it's just there's, there's not finding any holes uh lost to lease two percent that's going to be like um Lost to lease is basically your 
like concessions, things like that, where you're um, essentially deciding like concessions would be, uh, you know, a first month free, right. Or uh, turnover as a loss to lease. If, if something stays, you know, rented out, or I mean, stays vacant for too long. Um, let's see, how does he define it in here? He's got, Oh, okay. So I was wrong. Loss of lease refers to the difference between properties, market rents, and the average actual rents. So what this would mean on an annual basis is basically concessions, right? So I have, so I was right. So I have it at two percent. Basically, a concession would uh, would go to loss to lease because let's say let's say you gave your first month free and it was a thousand dollar rent. That's you know, on an annual basis, you only are collecting 11,000 instead of the 12,000 possible, right? So the thousand dollars a month, that's 12,000 a year. But if you give the first month free, you're only at most can collect 11,000 from that tenant. So there you have lost a lease. Uh, concessions, non-revenue, kind of the same thing there. Um, th this can include like employee discounts or free units. Uh, you know, if you have a free unit for an onsite manager or something like that, um, very deal dependent. I have it at 2%, uh, bad debt, uh, 2% as well. This basically refers to uncollectible rent. Um, you know, having to evict people, things like that. And then reserves per unit. Uh, I have it set to 300 just because this was a class A and and you really aren't going to need a high amount of reserves per unit. You know, this is going to cover like cleaning fees and things like that, right? I have it at 300. What's going to cost you 200 bucks to clean after someone, especially in a class A, right? You got that upper class tenant, which is typically going to uh, equal, you know, better quality tenant, which is typically going to, you know, equal less uh, routine maintenance, or less maintenance or cleaning at the end if they if they move out. So, so there you have it. A uh, very long episode. We covered a lot today, but uh, very grateful for you guys as always for listening. Uh, very very excited next week. Uh, this will come midweek, so I'll have a little bit of an update from the first two days, but uh, we'll kind of save the full recap of best ever. Uh, again, follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Johnny Katani, J O N N Y C A T T A N I. Johnny with no H is the best way to remember it. Thank you guys for listening. I'll talk to you next week. See ya. Thank you again for tuning in. Who do you know that wants more cash flow? Share this episode with them so you can grow your cash flow together. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you're subscribed on your platform of choice so you never miss a new episode. Go to katanicapitalgroup.com to learn more.